Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Source the Saurus podcast. I'm Zach Reed. And I'm Devra. And this is our recap of SVP from Brisbane, Australia. So, uh, we were in Australia, for in Brisbane, for SVP, as clearly stated in the intro. Uh, and that's the Society for Vertebrate Paleontologists, for those who are not aware of the acronym. Yeah, that that would probably be a good idea to list that. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we actually went for a longer period than we normally do. Usually, the conference itself runs for about, what, three to four days? Four days, yep. Uh, but instead, we went, and we actually were down there earlier in Sydney for vacation, while you also did some research at one of the museums in Sydney. Yep. And then about Sunday evening, we headed up to Brisbane, and then we did some extra stuff that we were uh, up there for that we usually don't participate in, or not don't want to participate in, but we just usually end up not having enough time. Right. So normally with SVP, there's field trips and workshops the couple days before um and sometimes field trips after which we didn't do since we had gone down before uh svp but so we went on a tour of rocks and fossils around the brisbane area which was really interesting got to hear about the geology of the area um and some of the fossils that are found around and outside of brisbane um and then the day before the conference started, we did some workshops, which I think will be a decent chunk of what we'll talk about. Um, so I went to two workshops. We both started off with the fossil ethics business law with the, um, what anniversary of UNESCO, the... Oh God, I'd have to look at my notes. It's some but... anniversary of UNESCO. I think the at least the 40th because if i remember correctly it was from the 70s at least yeah 50th maybe i'm not i don't remember entirely but um some anniversary of unesco and it's been a conversation that svp's been participating in and joining uh more in the recent years um with some of the social and legal stuff against um national parks and resources um, in the states, so it was really interesting to hear a global perspective on all that stuff. And then I jumped ship after lunch and went to a woman in paleo um, workshop where we talked about uh, a couple of the main issues that women in science in general and in paleontology and academia have to um, work with, primarily. Um, what got mostly discussed in terms of people uh, giving some short presentations, um, and then we did some roundtables as well. Um, but yeah, so we did that, and then we're off to the races with going to talks and posters in the normal conference getup. I guess uh, something I was just thinking about, we should probably explain a little bit what this conference is because while we just explained that svp is the society for vertebrate paleontology probably explaining that this conference is the kind of like the big gathering every year for mm -hmm. paleontologists that go to a host city that um a lot of times the talks actually end up pertaining to a lot of the fossils or paleontologic work that actually goes on in that region mm -hmm. um but it's a giant community gathering for all of us within the society um to discuss various things from research topics poster topics there's symposiums and discussions we have you know auctions and silent auctions which go to various fundings and charities for um, the for the society for the society mm -hmm. um i think this not this year but last year's silent auction went to helping fund a couple of the uh, Madagascar students to come to uh, Brisbane, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Yeah, it went towards funding travel. Yeah, and that's usually what a lot of these auctions and purchases and stuff like that. And the society isn't actually just um, researchers or people presently in academia. There's people from all walks of life. There's amateurs. There's people like myself who are trying to get into programs. 
Um, you see students, you see professors, industry, industry mm-hmm. representatives, and that's not just like uh, technical people. Like here's a new air scribe, but you see for people who do things like dinosaur modeling or animal modeling, you see that you know the preservation stuff. You see schools advertise. It's a good way for a lot of the local universities to kind of get their information out there. Um, this is one of the bigger international trips. I think, if I remember correctly, the last big one was to the UK or Berlin. Germany. Yeah, Berlin was in 2014, I think. Um, they do a non-North American one every five years. Um and to kind of encourage the international membership um so yeah the last one was in berlin and then this one that we just got done with was down in australia which was was the first um southern hemisphere uh svp meeting in svp history which i have nothing but good things to say yeah (laughs) I did like on our tour through uh, Queensland, um, kind of seeing all the geology and the different types of stuff there, uh, seeing their definition of mountains comparative to (laughs) a bunch of different one of us. We had a representative from South Africa with us, and he does a lot of mountain research. We came from Montana (laughs) and North America, where they're all over the place with the Rocky Mountains and Appalachia. And when you see them standing on top of one of the other big lines of sight it's not really that that (laughs) tall but it's you know it's funny they even acknowledge it they're like this is our large mountains right (laughs) but you know we had that um i was really and uh fascinated because that's kind of stuff i'm starting to uh, orient myself towards is the the ethics and laws and regulations around paleo because we don't really get taught that very much in school or when we're with professors outside of things like here are blm laws here are this the grants you have to write and And that's only if you you do do field work with your advisor yeah there's no it's really interesting there's no um like you said information given about all these other issues that are very important to the success of the field and and clearly there was a bigger push now and trying to steer too far off of the political aspect of it but i think it's fairly it it's not political to say that the national monuments have been threatened cut yeah. and threatened and that there is a general um i'm blanking on the word but a, a general not caring about the environment um, in the past few years in the states, I think, is a fairly apolitical thing to say. Those fairly, you know, true. They, they've demonstrated that without, be, you know, leaning one way or the other. Right, and that was primarily the majority of like the opening bit talks was over stuff kind of pertaining to the national parks and kind of responses to both the political landscape as well as just other aspects of blm and national park land kind of responses national monuments yeah yeah um one big thing once you left that was brought up was kind of uh what turned into kind of a, not a not a firefight per se but more of a pissing contest eh, no it wasn't really that it was two ideological differences um because to preface it it was led by a discussion about certain and i don't know because usually at these events they have a uh not a gag rule but a respect to the content kind of um material so that certain people's research and data don't get out there before they're published Mm -hmm. i i can't remember if there was anything particularly based on this um and because it does deal with some legal stuff i won't go too in depth detail everything with the monument because it's a lawsuit against the administration is public knowledge or you know public Mm -hmm. entity at least um i'm not uh, well it's not the the and the the two monuments that usually get discussed the most at this event uh, were primarily for us was the uh grand staircase escalante 
and then you had uh, Bear Ears, which... This is the newest one that's got Right, out, which yeah. is one of the bigger kind of talking points was Grand Stair has 20-plus uh, years of being federally protected. It's a national park. It's a huge paleontological site, um, and it's getting a lot of issues because some of the areas where they're, quote-unquote, reducing for better protections are the areas where all these fossils are. Mm-hmm. It was it was kind of funny to see the map where they go, here's all the items that we have that are covered with paleontological sites and specimen locations, etc. And now, click, here's the black areas. Those are the things that are no longer going to be protected. And it was almost a one-to-one of those mm-hmm. areas, which makes sense. I mean, if you think about the, the natural resources that they, that want to be opened up to fossil fuel industry stuff is um specifically in areas where you would see a lot more biological deposits Mm -hmm. it just is kind of a one goes with the other um but that's a big legal case that's going on and just to see the amount of people that are partnered up with svp alone it was something i didn't know about bear ears is a little harder because it's only a decade maybe less than less than that um obama created it as a national monument like his last couple of years in office okay so yeah it doesn't have a lot of it, it and also it has paleontologic stuff but it's more i believe archaeologic specific yeah and because it's so new there hasn't been the and, understanding and depth of what's there and what's the research capacity or there's no research impact on what we know because there hasn't been time to do research there whereas at least at grand staircase they can point to papers and the impacts of those areas that have that have had been on you know paleo research and stuff like that that isn't there for bear's ears because there has been time to do that research to find out what the impact is right and the the other big thing is those sites aren't the only ones being impacted Mm -hmm. things like dinosaur national monument and some of the more well-known fossil sites are also being defunded deregulated deprotected and it's one of those things where svp and kind of people around it are trying to come up with a way to explain that once these items are these aren't renewable respawnable resources or <laughs> items respawn it makes it sound like minecraft just well, like wait a little bit and dig some more and you'll find some more f- <laughs> well i think that's i think that really is a general approach of most no, of yeah. the public is oh well you know this one's gone just dig a little deeper you'll find another one yeah. and it's it's not and that's kind of the thing i think we're kind of trying to organize or see organizations now become less reactive and more proactive mm-hmm. um where one of the more interesting talks came about was actually t- uh, was brought up by the Queensland representation, um, which was the uh, discussion of the if I if I'm getting this correct and I apologize if I get it cor- incorrect <laughs> was the indigenous owners is what they called them or something of that mm-hmm. effect uh, for those who aren't trying to stay up to date on lingo, um, the Aboriginal descendants, those, uh, the, they, the history of uh, the indigenous peoples of uh, Australia is very, very similar to what Canada and America have to deal with as well. But they do an interesting thing where they've gone to the point where they acknowledge the indigenous and Aboriginal people yeah. with almost any state or government funded um work or building or museum so we noticed it when we were in sydney first um Mm -hmm. and going into any museum or even we went to the opera house to see a show they start off saying that we acknowledge that this is the native land of the aboriginal peoples of whatever the tribes were And, you know, we thank them and all of that stuff. And that's everywhere. It's Mm -hmm. inside museums. It's up on the websites of those museums. Um, And that mentality has translated and been included in how paleontologists in Australia, at least the ones that we talk to, um, go about doing fossil work on Aboriginal land, which, I mean, 
everywhere is Aboriginal land. But right. um, they acknowledge that they probably knew about these fossils um, and that, you know, the white settlers weren't the first ones to look at them and think what they were. Um, so the huge national acknowledgement of the Aboriginal peoples in Australia, which was really cool just to experience while we were down there. And and one of the cool things is they don't just reference them in papers like, and with the assistance of blank, some of them actually are co-authors on a lot of Australian papers because of the significance of which uh, the information and assistance they provide is not just a acknowledgement, acknowledgement section uh, worthy thing. They're mm-hmm. actually contributing to the research. Um, one of the cooler stories was they discussed the the lawmaker. It's a story about um, basically their create one of their creation stories uh, about a moa, if I remember correctly. And as the one of the Queensland, Queensland representatives was talking about it, he mentioned that one of the uh, indigenous owners basically was like, "Hey." Not a lot of people know about this, but do you want to see where we kind of have that story line up? And they took them, and it was a Triassic fossil track site that they were able to find that no one would have even saw had they not very politely come in and were like, hey, we know of this spot where no one else is. Let me show you. They also don't try to refute any of the stories or any of their creation myths or legends or however you want to spin it and i'm probably gonna offend somebody with that (laughs) but they don't try to fight or counter and go no no here's the thing it's basically two parties going well here's our folklore behind it and then the paleontologists go well here's our science behind Mm -hmm. it and both kind of look at how that can contribute to each other it's a very interesting way very symbiotic and and Mind you, I make it sound very kumbaya, but even they acknowledge that there's a lot of distrust. Mm-hmm. There are people who aren't cooperative. They are There are people who are like, I'm just going to shove my way in there and get what I want, which has made them very defensive and very protective. And apparently one of the big issues is because of this, n- not, not dis- outright distrust, but this skeptical distance keeping, they... Um, they send emails, they send phone calls, eventually they just have to go to that spot and kind of plead their case, and it takes a while to build up that trust and familiarity, and you have to do it a few times. There's research they were talking about that's been kind of stonewalled because of there is a, a level of friction in the relationship, and they're trying to work on that. But... I mean, that you see in other places, I'm sure, in the States, um my advisor there's a site in wyoming where we work or an area of land that's on one of the reservations in wyoming um that early paleontologists and i think the 40s and 50s had an agreement with the native americans and were allowed to go fossil hunting and collecting on their land and somehow that agreement did not get continued um i think the last time people did research physically like stepping on that land was I think the 70s or 80s and it's pretty much like my advisor has reached out a couple times again trying to get in contact with them but short of going onto their land and hoping to not get shot um there's not much that you can do if they don't want to like if they don't want to engage right and, and it's something that kind of became a talking point which is where that kind of friction in the room and it wasn't real <laughs> friction that's not a fair description it was Tension? M- yeah you could you could tell there was because t- one was talking about all the stuff that they have with the indigenous peoples of Australia and it, it was it was great to hear their perspective and it was really fascinating because it is an ideal set and an, an approach that I personally haven't heard or seen done a lot you have heard or we heard descriptions and breakdowns and stories and research uh from things like uh, from people representing the BLM and some mm-hmm. other organization uh, other bodies and they talked about both good things as well as bad things cuz just like anything in life when there's good there's always that one person or individual groups that just see a financial gain out of it right which is a big thing um the other big talk was about uh UNESCO which um 
I can't remember off the top of my head the entire acronym, but um, basically it covers things like repatriation. Uh, it was a big thing because uh, for a very long time historically, you know, especially with like paleontology, North America was a big one, the UK, okay. Germany. UNESCO is United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. So that's the one you normally hear about heritage sites mm-hmm. or like, you know, the, the pyramids, the, the great wall, like stuff that is either culturally, societally, glo- like, but globally important enough to merit keeping and merit keeping mm-hmm. care of. Um, and in, I didn't look that far down the website, um, earlier in the 20th century, fossils and natural resources got added into the UNESCO Protections Act to therefore include fossils, um, geology sites, archaeological sites, anything that can be essentially found in the ground but has not been built to be included in that protection um, that UNESCO gives. Right, and and that was a big thing that they covered was kind of the different approaches and kind of seeing we heard from like brazil who Mm -hmm. uh if people aren't familiar last year had a terrible tragedy where their their national museum burned and they lost a lot of research materials collection stuff Mm -hmm. but they were they weren't so much talking about that but they were but the main thing they <laughs> talked about were actually the fact of how protective they are of the Brazilian fossils. Uh, apparently, from what I was told while we were there, uh, one has made it out of the country in the time that they've applied these rules and regulations. Um, I think if they said they made it to Colombia? It made it to another South American, Central American country. To which, when it was found, they sent it back. Um, but there is certain specimens that have gotten out that Brazil is very aggressively trying to mm-hmm. get returned because they're saying that it, you know, basically well, along with UNESCO was like, this is not yours. This is the state of Brazil's. This is our national fossils and very. And and essentially, what happens is countries like. Any global plan or protection act, countries sign on to it. And by signing on to it, they say that they will... Um, honor it. Honor it and buy into the rules, not only for their own country, but if they um, find or know of um, situations where, like specifically for fossils, where fossils have been inappropriately or illegally taken out of other countries that are part of UNESCO... Um, that it is other countries' responsibilities, if they've signed on, to inform the proper authorities and to help get those materials back to the country of origin. Now, from what it seems, not every country that has signed on to UNESCO does that 100% of the time. No, one of the ones I kind of enjoyed, not enjoyed, but it gave me a good chuckle, was basically... Uh, from one of the gentlemen in Australia basically mentioned how there's been a conflict over certain types of fossil evidence from the 60s, 50s, backwards, up until the 70s, that the uh, London Museum uh, basically had taken them, used them in research, but then it's causing issues with things like holotype identification, um... Because essentially their agreement, and this, it was uh, apparently the U.S. museums are in the minority of having everything be contractual um, and therefore having the ability to threaten lawsuits all the time. Apparently other countries and uh, other museums in other countries operate just on operate, agreement. Right, just operate under field agreements. Um, like, yes, we worked on this field site together. You are the you know, bigger museum or you funded more of it or whatever the deal is, you can take some of the fossils back initially and then you will return them and they will be cataloged under our museum from the get-go. You will give us co-authorships and acknowledgements in the papers. And apparently in this one instance, it started out like that and then um, 
the London Museum wasn't giving all of the, stopped cataloging them for the Australian Museum catalog, and then um, were doing some slightly shady stuff with marking which specimens were going to be holotypes, and holotype is a particular specimen that demonstrates all of the characteristics that a researcher would need to identify that species. Um, And it's used as a marker against other unknown fossil specimens to compare it against known specimens. So it's important for holotypes to be the most complete and to be the most preserved and have all the characteristics that researchers are supposedly finding in that species so that research other researchers can compare it. Apparently, um, specimens that were not as complete were being marked as the holotypes because the agreement was all the holotypes would be sent back to Australia. So what happened, what sounds like, is that specimens that necessarily weren't supposed to be holotypes, were marked as such so that they would get sent back while the better specimens would stay in London. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, because they might know about this happening, but since it was no contract and holotypes aren't marked in the field, they're marked after research, it becomes a very hard to nail down and hard to get mad at people situation. Yeah, it seems like a it, it was a very gray area of not full discernment of who was in the right, who was in the wrong, what's right, what's wrong. Though the thing that made me chuckle, and I think if I remember you kind of elbowed me because I chuckled a little too loud, was the, <laughs> uh, the museum from Australia sent a letter saying, hey, this is ours, we have this agreement, you were supposed to identify us, you were supposed to credit us, you were supposed to mark our stuff. We would like you to return our our fossil property. And the London Museum basically responded in a very short and curt, well, it was given to us as a gift and you can't prove otherwise, so it's ours. <laughs> and it's the most professional way I've ever heard finders keepers <laughs> ever. And it just made me giggle. I mean, yes, this is a topic that does need an, an actual, you know, uh, serious take on it because this is a bigger issue but at the same time it is hilarious to hear a big institute going no it's mine na 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 (laughs) instead of actually like oh well we'll try to work it out which is actually interesting that they they kept bringing up the united states because you know there there is criticism or mockery sometimes amongst americans that we are lawsuit happy <laughs> but to hear a lot of the paleontologists refer to it they're like the americans have a very good grasp on this because nothing gets done right without like, triplicates of everything and if a museum's you know even late with returning a loan it's like you get call, this... calling the lawyers and yeah <laughs> right and they they mentioned one story where it was an actual board member of a museum is their chief legal analyst who immediately called and was like give it back or we will be pulling out all the legal mm-hmm. stops to have this item returned and everyone's like okay okay we're sending it calm down <laughs> so it's it's very interesting to see that there's a diametric dip, uh, difference in certain philosophies in terms of the legality of things mm-hmm. You wouldn't think, especially in today's world, that the gentleman's agreement at handshake would still exist in the sense of specimen collection, but... Oh, it does. I mean, I i don't even think... It might be happening with my advisor and the people we work out in the field because um, it's essentially... We have two crews out there working the same area, um, and whoever... Like, which of the students finds what, it goes to their advisor's stuff. So me being from UNL, anything I find will go back to the UNL museum. The other crew from New York, anything they find will go back to their institution in New York. Um, And for the most part it works because we generally work at least somewhat a couple feet away from each other. Um... And I think they sometimes joke about trading who found what if, you know, something that the other person found lines up better with the other's research interests. Um, And it all works out 
when people are straightforward about it, Mm -hmm. it only stops working when someone takes advantage, which I think is the case in most good faith systems. Right. And this, this is stuff that fascinates me and probably in future career paths, I'll be focused and looking at some of this stuff more often. Um, but moving on to other stuff, <laughs> uh, so we don't get bogged down on just one day's worth of stuff. Um, the following day, we actually we went to some of the talks, which was the opening day of the actual conference, mm-hmm. which you know uh, the conference has usually three to four rooms, depending on the size of the yeah. venue, um, where they have a morning session, which runs from probably eight in the morning till. What would you say, 12, 12, 40, 12, 45? 12, 15. 12, 15? Yep. Uh, they run in the mornings uh, that um, and that session. Each room will be divided by a specific topic, whether it's dinosaur paleontology, mammalian, um, uh, insects, or probably not because that's not vert. That's not vert, um, but... <laughs> but, but it'll cover different... So, and it won't just be like dinosaurs mammals you know sometimes it'll be divided into teeth or adaptational ecologic based it Mm -hmm. it's really dependent on whatever committee decides what they want that year Mm -hmm. um but that was kind of that and then we have like a what hour hour 15 lunch break and then it's actually longer than because afternoon session starts at 145 okay so yeah uh so we have, and, a half, yeah. Yeah. and then we have basically from one forty-five till four, yeah, uh, the afternoon session, which will continue, um, the thing, and the the talks are all about fifteen minutes long, if everybody stays, stays on, on time. <laughs> and the, it's it's a gamut. Sometimes you get somebody who does a you know ten minute presentation and has five minutes for questions, and sometimes you have somebody who who does a sixteen minute does presentation, a, and yeah. then it's a catch up game, and it's it's kind of funny to watch <laughs> i would not be able to be one of the admins because i would no yeah. i would be like um because uh, i used to help do timekeeping for wrestling mm-hmm. one of the big things was when there was 30 seconds left you know you had the clappers clap clap that would signify to the ref hey we're almost at there but then you would get a towel that we basically you know some had batons but what we had was a towel wrapped in duct tape <laughs> and basically at 10 seconds you wind up to throw it and at the bell, you just whip that thing as hard as you can into the <laughs> middle of the mat to stop the mat. I would be that guy. I would be as, you know, and here you are as we discuss the theropod teeth. And then just biff them in the head. Like, you're up. You're out. And then probably Zach would not be allowed to admin anymore. Um, but after that, we did the diversity luncheon. Mm-hmm. And that was actually a really interesting thing because... We the purpose of it was you were actually allowed to get up and move and talk about you know there was mental health there was women in paleontology there was diversity there was a couple different topics mm-hmm. we ended up staying at the same table the entire time because yeah. I think it's something that we both really care about is diverse representation in paleontology and we, and we've talked about it on the first podcast mm-hmm. uh, you know how we're you know at least with the show and some of the you know episodes of the youtube show we want to show that there's more than just straight white dudes who exist in paleo (laughs) we don't need to go over that entire basic topic again but it was interesting to see a table of people who are really trying to expand the representation and like you said internationally we're supposed to be a society for vertebrate paleontology and we do primarily exist within the continental north america Um, I don't think we've... Have we ever gone to, like, Mexico or any of the South? From what they were saying, no. Um, yeah, so it's it's very interesting to see that it's primarily kept within the continental United States and Canada. Right. Which... <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, North America, so... Right. But um, it, it's really interesting seeing that and then hearing people talk about, like, the international people really do want to attend, but, you know how often can a guy from, you know, South Africa get to Cincinnati? Yeah. It, it's it's just like us. We had to save for a full year to and, go and to... And I think it, having it in Brisbane was hopefully an eye-opener mm-hmm. for um, some of the people that might be a little bit more... Um, not against, but for some people that might not be so... 
willing to change how many times we have an international conference or where it gets held or, or something like that. Hopefully the having to travel down to Australia was a little bit of an eye opener of what all the other international folks have to travel to to get to North America, but unfortunately is a North America dominant membership. Right. So I think that will always prevail in some respect True. of it being most um, situated for the majority of the membership. It's not saying we shouldn't have more international meetings or we shouldn't have them more frequently, but th- it does need to, you know, there needs to be a mm-hmm. balance. And we talked about that and we talked about having the meeting itself um, be more inclusion based. Um, and that was something that got brought up in the workshop I was in the day before, which was more focused on just women in paleo. Um, And one of the roundtable things that got discussed as we were towards the end of the workshop was how can students um, be, like, feel more welcome, especially their first time. Um, And it was an idea that got brought up um, in the Women in Paleo workshop that everybody liked the following day in the diversity lunch, and there's some, there's some overlap of organizers, um, which was what other societies do sometimes is essentially a buddy program for people that are new coming into the meeting for the first time. They can um, sign into this mentoring partnership And it doesn't have to be very long term. It can just be for that day. It can be for the conference itself. And if connections are made, then that's great going forward. But it essentially gives um, new members a way to get to know people, somebody to give them tips about, you know, what to do, what all that stuff that um, I think some people take for granted that it's like, oh, everyone knows how to go to a conference and doesn't even, like, either doesn't remember um, what it was like when they started or they started so long ago that it's completely changed now for new people coming in. Well, I mean, some of them, and, and we've seen this with some of our, you know, colleagues or other groups, you'll see people from, like, one university, especially if the conference is close to them, they'll come in a whole group. So mm-hmm. there there is that, like, almost uh, pack group use you know they're used to that you know okay i have my friends i don't need to worry too much someone knows what they're doing right whereas like with me i'm this is only my third uh svp and it's my second one internationally or not (laughs) internationally but uh, second one outside of the united states right which i kind of enjoy i like that ratio Mm because i've already been through the u.s with a lot of just personal travel and stuff Mm -hmm. So going to places like Calgary and now Australia was fantastic. But uh, when I went up to Calgary to meet with you, um, because I had never done it, I basically followed you around like a puppy. Because <laughs> I was like, I have no clue what I'm doing. I have no idea what the social cues or the timing or any. I was terrified because uh, going into it, I had been out of paleo for about a year to because I just removed myself for personal, you know, uh, projects outside of that and coming back in i'm like oh my god if i say something wrong or i'm like i don't know your research i felt like i would hear the you know traditional comedy record scratch and didn't i'd get the scarlet paleo letter and be like (laughs) that idiot doesn't belong here but i i could you know speaking from that experience i get that fear and i can understand like having somebody there just to be like no worries, go to this. Mm-hmm. This is, you know, a good way to get your feet wet. You don't have to go to every single... Talk, yeah. Because that was one thing I talked to you about. I'm like, oh my God, we have to marathon all these talks. Like, and you're no, like, we don't. no, if you don't have any interest or there's nothing research related that you need to see, we don't have to go or to these talks. your brain's just tapping out by the end of right, it. Right. Because can... that did happen my first year. And granted, I had a somewhat of a pack because um, there were a few of us from Montana going to Dallas together and we roomed together. Um, but we were presenting on different things and all that stuff. I mean, there is a bit of a comfort blanket when you do have multiple people going, even if it is all of your first times, you can fumble fuck your way through it together. Um, 
and you might know older people that can help you a little bit coming from a bigger school that's paleo heavy. Um, but yeah, I mean, by the end of the week, like my brain was just so tired that like I had to, and then I saw like a ton of people just sitting outside the conference rooms, just like either chilling or on their computers or doing other work. And it was like, oh, like I don't have to go to every single one. Like I can sit outside or I can take a longer lunch break. Like no one's policing us saying you have to go to everything or I don't have to stay for the full poster session, all of that stuff. Um, I mean, it does tie into other issues in paleo and in academia about, you know, having, I don't want to say free will, but having expectations and feeling like you need permission to not do some of those. That's a whole mm-hmm. separate yeah, that's topic. A, that's a whole bag <laughs> of itself. Um, but yeah, it, the diversity luncheon was really fun to, to kind of just be able to talk to different people, get a whole bunch of different perspectives. Um, they brought up things like minority representation mm-hmm. and kind of just how... Uh, we really didn't, like, we didn't know this until we met the woman who's kind of championing it at the, um, at the luncheon, but there's a female founder of SVP that really doesn't get much recognition, and she was championing, like, kind of making her a more prevalent force and be represented at, or be, you know, kind of... Acknowledged. Kind of like it, the the past, like, five years of push to recognize mary anning for right. her work in early paleontology in the late 1800s kind of doing that with other pale- other female paleontologists right, it's becoming the not just mary hero. anning right <laughs> right it's becoming the unsung heroes and we've gotten to meet actually a few of them as well um uh, oh bollocks i can't remember her name i feel horrible about that um, okay yes She was, you know, and we've gotten to meet her, you know, Mm -hmm. and she's lovely and I feel horrible. I forgot her name for a brief (laughs) moment there. Uh, I'm definitely recording this after a long day. Um, But, you know, there was that. And then there's a very valid point that there have been African-American and Hispanic paleontologists and other Mm -hmm. uh, individuals that are either at the foundation of it or within the building framework of SVP and paleontology as a whole that really haven't gotten acknowledged or a lot of the records that kind of acknowledge them have been kind of lost, not out of like malice or anything, just negligence. Or just that record was never made um, to have been lost or kept, like... I think the um, main guy that we were talking with at the round table and the organizers or talkers um, was talking about trying to find, like, the first African-American paleontologist. And, like, the records just don't exist. Like, and again, I don't think it's out of malice. It's just, like, they either didn't think recording whose race, you know, who had what race was pertinent. And if that's the case, that's very progressive for you know, a society Mm -hmm. or it just, some records did not get written down and kept or whatever. Um, it might be a combination of, of both for like Mm -hmm. early, um, meeting attendees, unless there's a really obvious name, it might not be clear their ethnic background or their race. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's not something SVP asks about in registration. Like, right. (laughs) Which is also very nice. And one of the cool things that we actually got to see was um, SVP implement the pronouns mm-hmm. uh, preference. Yeah, there are stickers that you could pick up at the registration table and put on your badge um, if you wanted to support um, identifying pronouns. And then they had the uh, LGBTQ dinner as mm-hmm. well. And the, there's a lot. There's a very large push, it seems, and it, and it does seem that it's a generational thing. Oh, it's definitely a generational thing. It's, it's coming a- from the, you know, mid to late, um, twenty year olds, maybe early thirties, but essentially either current grad students or early career. Which I don't think is a slam against anyone in the society. I don't oh, think it's no, no, this no. Yeah. bigoted thing, not at all. And I don't want it getting construed as that. But what uh, I think is happening is 
it was a thing that they didn't think needed to be acknowledged. Right. And now it's getting pushed, not as like we demand, you know, that this is all that you talk about, but just simple acknowledgement goes a long way. Well, it's the same with mental health, which is a whole separate topic. Um, But the being more open about it and having resources and stuff like that within, in general, academia. But there's been some stuff specifically that, you know, in paleo and in the conferences and meetings, the awareness of that has really been the past five, I don't think even 10 years, Mm -hmm. um, with the kind of early career scientists that are now on some committees have a little bit more a little bit higher up in the pecking order, but still are close enough to remember, you know, stuff they went through in grad school and know that it was not the norm to go, well, it's the norm to go through it. It shouldn't be the norm to go through it. Right. Um, and raising awareness about that and making it more okay to speak up about it um, and everything like that. That's definitely been a generational push as well. Right, and it, it was it's nice to see the the mental health stuff's getting acknowledged as well. Their their ideas of you know breaking up some of the just marathoning people have to do, mm-hmm. and you know we discuss things like the arguments of it's you know tri- it's been done like this for years. This is what I went through. Right, and, a pseudo hazing. Right, not an actual like here we're gonna fat boy haze, but like right. essentially certain advisors are like, well, this is the way I did my comps, this is the way I did my PhD, so I'm going to expect the same thing for you, while not acknowledging that that way is extremely harmful to mental health, um, and basically is just like you just have to tough it out. That's how you get your PhD mentality where. Is a high pushback of no, that doesn't need to be the case. Right. Like we're not gonna, you know, stand for just being told you have to work, you know, till midnight every night or. Right, and even at the conference, like the poster session, um, I'm not even someone that's experienced that, but I'm just the schmuck with the microphone and just a passion that's walked through it. I'm stressed out for them. <laughs> You, you basically have to stand for two hours two hours and let's be honest it's more like three three and a half because they have to stay there they have to get there beforehand yep they, they get there around four and the post session doesn't start till 4 15 and then it technically ends I think at 6 15 or 6 30 but yeah but no one ever actually le- like it's not a like a, a store or a restaurant where they no. give you a last call and everyone's <laughs> got to shuffle out by that and then they lock them. I mean, I think the conference stopped selling booze at 6.15. Right. But, you know, <laughs> and, and that's, an, you know, that was an interesting thing that I never thought of. I've been around it so much. Yeah. I'm just like, oh, okay, this is just what we do. We have a, you know, glass of wine. We talk about And even this. if I don't want to drink that night, I don't have any um, personal problems or you know, feelings towards being in the same room as alcohol or whatever, but it got brought up that, like, the post session is very alcohol-centric, and there are religions that don't align with that. There are just personal choices Uh um, or past histories that don't align with that, and by not offering any um, other times in the meeting schedule, you're forcing some of these especially younger students or more diverse minorities members to be in a room that they're just going to be initially uncomfortable with. And then on top of that, you get older professors and faculty that like to do the, I'm going to ask you a ton of questions that you won't know, you know, and I expect you to try and figure that. I mean, it's a pseudo like defense at your poster Right, and if that is a stress-inducing factor. I could not, I, yeah, I would be drinking by the end of it. Just, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's very, it's very nice to see them taking a proactive approach to discuss these topics, because mm-hmm. I came from a different organization that isn't paleo-related, that's 
it just uh, conservation, environmental protection related, that did the opposite. Like, anytime anyone under the age of 30 brought up anything, just got shut down mm-hmm. immediately, you haven't earned your stripes, this isn't, this isn't your place to bring this up. Mm-hmm. And now one of the big problems with that organization, and I've, I've, I'm tertiary kind of involved with it, <laughs> I, you know, I still discuss things with certain members and, you know, occasionally respond to emails, but I'm, I'm pretty much out of it and, you know, only I'm still a member in name only. And their big issue is, you know, we're, we're having a generational deficit. Mm-hmm. We don't have anyone of this generation represented, or if we do, it's a very minute number. Whereas I feel like all of these are being done by the society in a far faster manner mm-hmm. that they don't have to worry about that massive gap happening. Right, and I think it it is nice because you don't necessarily have to wait until you're retired to be the president of SVP. Most people, I think, get it when they're in their mid-career, so you at least have a younger um, head. Right. Um, and then a lot of the committees i think are starting to include more graduate students and more early careers uh, early career paleontologists on the society committees which is really how stuff gets changed um but i think svp was one of the first societies to adopt a really comprehensive code of conduct and a lot of the other main geology societies kind of built theirs off of svps and they even revamped theirs this year with more steps outlined Mm -hmm. on um you know actions and the steps needed to be taken and everything like that and they have retaliatory action built in as a separate that becomes a separate Mm -hmm. um harassment essentially or a separate um thing that you report um but on like the other side like SVP, I think, next year is going to be implementing um, child care, either for, like, hours or for the full day, Um, obviously at a fee, but that helps um, parents, like, plan how to bring their kids and not just have their kids in the session rooms, which we saw some kids in the session rooms, and they were very well behaved, so I didn't even have a problem with that, but they've had i think nursing rooms and family rooms the past couple of years that is basically a quiet room um that families or you know whatever can go in there and be in a more secure private area right and and that's great and especially because then it, it it allows a lot more professors and their significant others to be able to attend um it just gives the a very much uh, uh, easy pathway to mm-hmm. more professors and people being able to attend when normally, well, now I got to count in the financials of getting my family there. Then how are they going to you mm-hmm. know, be, I don't want to leave my wife and my kids or my husband and my kids just shoved up in a hotel, hotel room. room. Right. Or leave them at home. Or, right. Yeah. You know, especially like Australia or even if it's to like you know a Texas or yeah. New York or Chicago or something, n- bigger cities where there are things that families or other people you know we go uh, every year to you know the or at least the last few years to these conferences we don't just go to the conference, wake up, go there, go to right. lunch and go to the hotel, <laughs> fall asleep, reboot battery, come back. We've gone out. We've seen the petroglyphs in New mm-hmm. Mexico. We've gone. And done stuff in Calgary, you know, Sydney. We, we, we did a whole week right. to Sydney, but we also did stuff in Brisbane. You know, people went to the Taronga Zoo, or not Taronga Zoo, the um, uh, Steve Irwin Zoo mm-hmm. down there, or the Lone Pine uh, Zoo down there. The people do make kind of a vacation out of it, because it is one of the few times that these individuals can go anywhere mm-hmm. outside of, you know, the academic life. But it, it it's really nice to see a very proactive approach to realizing these aren't just robots that regurgitate paleo. We have lives right. and values and ideas that aren't one-dimensional. And I think there's starting to become more awareness as more people publish on 
factors that cause minority drops and women drops in academia and in science, it's not that there's fewer of those demographics entering at an undergraduate level or even as a graduate level, but it's seen as what's called a leaky leaky pipeline. So essentially at each career stage jump going from undergrad to grad, going from graduate to early career, going from early career to, you know, assistant professor, then associate professor, then tenured professor, then, you know, emeritus. At every career stage, there's a drop in minorities and in women going to the next one, hence the leaky pipeline. At each Mm -hmm. seam, there's a leak. Um, And there's been research done on why at each stage women or and minorities are dropping out um and it's primarily due to lack of support resources um the stress on families or personal life um all like the essentially not um uh like but yeah essentially like marital life personal life um there's starting to become a little bit more uh, time given for maternal leave, but that's essentially based department to department. There's a lot of issues that are causing um, upper career stages, which are, to be honest, the people that are still making decisions and having them passed down to still be the white males. And I think the society's starting to attempt to address some of those systemic issues that are causing those leaks and causing those drops and trying to um, provide resources to help those people impacted, at least at the meetings. Obviously, Mm -hmm. they can't help at a person's, you know, place of work or whatever. Right. But um, starting to normalize things such as childcare and family rooms and all these other stuff that address those problems, if these societies start taking those actions, it will eventually bounce back to departments and other places of work to make it more normalized there as well. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a nice approach to things. Um, going on from there, I mean, were there any talks or anything? I mean, you gave a talk yourself. I gave a talk myself, um, and I gave it on kind of using trait diversity and distribution to identify regional biomes. Um, and it's an extension of my work done on my master's, which is building that. Um, and I pushed it back to the Holocene, so 10,000 years um, to the recent, and compared a couple of data sets to see how um, different data sets, the distribution within those data sets, how that separates out biomes um so i gave a talk at svp on that um and got a few nice feedbacks after the talk um either that same day or the next day um i don't know you love the giant wombat talk well yes because i i love I love wombats <laughs> at the, the intro dinner. So every, uh, the very first night every year, they have a welcoming ceremony where we usually go to the host city's main museum or one of the main museums. Um, this year it was at the Queensland museum and you were just tickled by this was we were meeting some friends of a mm-hmm. friend and we were all talking. And at one point somebody brought up that, you know, there was a wombat upstairs that you could actually pet. Mm hmm. And before you could really get the words out, I was like halfway down the hallway (laughs) making a beeline for it. Because wombats, since I was a little kid, have been one of the very few animals that I've I've really just oddly gravitated towards. (laughs) And I got to touch the wombat, and uh, I believe her name was Mrs. Bumpy. Yeah, something like that. And she just looks so content to just sit there in the handler's lap and just get stuck you know, petted and her ear scratched. By all of these semi-drunk paleontologists. Oh, it was it was amazing. And then they had, like, <laughs> a frilled lizard, a sugar glider. A spider. They had all the spiders that were nope territory. <laughs> um, but it, it was really fun for that. 
But going off of your comment about the giant wombat, yeah, the giant wombat is cool. I actually got a little figurine from one of the museums that now sits in our office. Um, but one of the cool parts about Australia uh, and some of the more specific symposium talks and actually just in general was you got to see a lot more representation of Asia, mm -hmm. Japan, Indonesia, you know, uh, they talked about like Gigantopithecus up in, I believe, India, if I remember mm -hmm. correct, or maybe, I might be wrong, I'd have to look at the, the, the roll call for the talks, but they talked about a lot more uh, Southern Hemisphere and Asia-based uh, paleontology which you don't hear about mm -hmm. unless you are very specifically hunting down that type right, of information. Right, unless you're a very high end, high up in the food chain researcher from those institutions, you normally don't make it to the North American SVPs. Mm -hmm. um, and if you are that high up, you're only going to be talking about a very narrow field of research. Um, but yeah, it was nice to not have almost every other um, session be about dinosaurs, which it normally is on in North America because... Which, again, nothing, dinosaurs, yeah. no, nothing's wrong with dinosaurs. We, that's how I got into the field. That's probably yeah, you know, that's your how entry point. I got, well, uh, kind of. Right, paleoanthro. But um, we also had... Uh, our, our primary training was in dinosaurs, dinosaur paleontology. Right. But it's nice, especially since both of us have gravitated towards mammalian paleontology seeing that represented um but also again it was cool to learn about australian based paleo stuff mm -hmm. um the fangaroo was one of my favorites because <laughs> um it's basically a kangaroo with fangs and it was fascinating to hear about it and hear about some of the research yeah. um Again, the giant wombat, they, they brought up another type of giant wombat as well that was, like, called the tapir wombat something or something like, like that. that. Yeah, I mean, if you, even because the hashtag will still be live on Twitter, um, Twitter during SVP is a joy because um, a lot of people will live tweet either just the titles of the talks if the, uh, if the author requests the talk not be tweeted about or they'll live tweet certain sentences or key points about the talk as the talk goes on. Um, and everyone just marks it with the hashtag 2019 SVP. And if you want to get a glimpse into what the sessions were like or anything like that, you can still search that on Twitter and it'll pop up. Um, and I mean, some people make nice jokes about it and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, it's a cool glimpse. And I know a lot of, excuse me, paleo people appreciated it this year because they weren't obviously able to get down to Australia. So it's also a tool that allows people that aren't at the conference to still get a gist of what's going on more than just mm -hmm. like the program book. I mean, it happens every year, but I think this year is a bit more useful because people, a lot more people weren't there. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's a quite entertaining because people will make cute cracks so there's a couple people that will like live doodle and take notes about each talk in like picture form and then take pictures of their drawings and upload it to svp uh to twitter as their like synopsis for each talk which how you can manage to like sketch a talk while listening to it and do it and make it look really good is like beyond me. Some of these sketches are really good. Yeah, I, I struggle sometimes taking notes. <laughs> with the speed at which some of these talks move. Um, and on top of that, follow me at, at Source the Source on Twitter. <laughs> Cheap plug. Um, Probably should have that in the podcast description. Oh, it, it will be, but yeah. Also, cheap, cheap plug. plug. Um, but yeah, like it, it was just really fun to see different talks. Um, there was a lot more administrative talks this year as well. Um, a lot more about just like museums and preparator stuff. And... Yeah, there, there was a, there's always a preparator session, but this year it kind of spanned outside of just technique based, mm -hmm. um, and was more about museum practices and collection practices as it pertains to fossils and to paleontology. Um, and we got to get an update on the collection upgrade um at our old 
school and museum, the Museum of the Rockies. So we got to get one of the talks was them moving their collections into um, a new home. And so we got to hear about that and how that all worked out. So that was fun for different reasons other than just being inter- interesting information. That was more amusement for us. Yeah. Than, <laughs> we were interested in hearing how they moved it because if you had ever gone back there, even if you weren't like actively looking for specimens, you have heard. You knew about it. You yeah. have heard the word. I have seen it. I never like actively went into it. Oh, I went into it to help with some class stuff and it was as bad as she described. Like, yeah. Yeah, no, I got the, he opened the door and here it is. And you just go, Jesus. And then you leave. <laughs> it, basically imagine if a bomb went off and it was contained. <laughs> there, there was with like fifty years plus of material, and it wasn't just and uh, it wasn't just fossil specimens. It was like old displays and old mannequins and all sorts of different like knickknacks. right. It became the dumping ground from the museum. Right, and then you know it was a twofold nightmare, both recording these items, but also some weren't catalogs, so there was no information, and oh, it was it was. Hearing her talk about it was like hearing a war veteran describe <laughs> coming back. It was, it was one of those things where it's like all of us in the room are going, we feel for you. <laughs> you know, it, but it was cool to see that, you know, they're, they're definitely expanding their representation on like education and communications and outreach. Mm-hmm. There's become... And yeah, there's been a lot more posters on that. Um, They've some, had more sometimes talks. There, sometimes there's... A specific session about um, the post, like an, an expansion on the posters. Sometimes it's just the posters. I think this year was just the posters, but the posters stay up the entire time. Um, and it's posters on essentially how paleontology can be used for outreach and for education. Um, so focus on either field camps or there was one poster on... Um, Using paleontology to connect with autistic kids. Um, there was the uh, the cosplay, cosplay science one. Um, so a lot of interesting new stuffs going on with education and outreach and using paleontology with that regards as well. And that would probably be the topic post you know session that you'd probably gravitate towards once you started doing stuff in mm-hmm. terms of communication. Eventually, hopefully, plus this. But anyway, um, it, yeah, it's, it's great that they're actually expanding the field. And I would love to see more representation of those type of things. Um, because I think that's the thing that they're realizing at the society is, well, the core foundation will always be just paleontology and the science of paleontology. They are coming to a very good uh, realization and middle ground that it is a business. We, mm-hmm. we have our, you know, paleontologists, again, I love calling it this, and if I ever get a shirt deal, I'm going to probably make it, <laughs> is paleo people are the Swiss Army scientist. Well, their their career is... <laughs> Sorry, the cat's just doing something really cute. <laughs> you probably heard her earlier. I don't think we'll be able to edit her out. <laughs> no, no, we won't. But... <laughs> The, the f- amazing part about paleontologists is we're also the Swiss Army career people. Yeah. You know, we do do education. We do do research. We we are involved with the Bureau of Land Management and we privatize companies as consultants. It's the huge swaths of different things we mm-hmm. can do. Um, it just depends on what your interests are. Right. Um, so to see more representation of that um, kind of starting to exist is is really really cool because now i feel and if it keeps growing it i think it'll be actually super beneficial for undergrads and young students or aspiring amateurs who want to go into the profession if they all come there and all of a sudden they're saying oh i could be more than just a quote-unquote teacher or i can right. be more than this you know i am a very political oriented person I do believe in, you know, kind of there needs to be more representation of us in kind of the legal side of things and not just legal in more, you know, lawsuit sense, but more in like coming, making laws. Well, and, yeah, yeah, the things like the Antiquities, you know, Act and all that kind of stuff. Um, just kind of 
making more protections for these specimens, mm-hmm. you know, not going back to the, the whole talk of the laws and ethics and everything, but that is something I'm interested in. And you've heard me say that since we left Australia. Right. Is I had no clue about right. the amount of that type of stuff. So for me to go there and go, oh, cool, there's this, and also the stuff I'm interested in in outreach and education is great, but then there's people who can go and also be like, well, I love dinosaurs, and all of a sudden they go, wait, I can study giant wombats, and then all of a sudden they have a whole career for, you know, Australian megafauna or just regular megafauna, you know. It's it's nice to see it now becoming more representative of the whole. Of the actual research that's going on rather than just the top five most popular research topics. To egg topics which again there's nothing wrong with that right there's still so much to be done even with the top five most popular like <laughs> every time that's we... the reason it's still there's still the top five most popular research like right. it, the research is still being done um but sometimes that does get amplified mm-hmm. um they get a little bit not circular but repetitive yeah i mean not even that like echo chamber Oh um, yeah. What was I? Th- that's what I was mm. searching for. They they stay within their bubble, and all they hear is that. Yeah. Which you know it it happens. It happens in research. You get right, very absolutely fixated on one or two things, and then that's all you ever focus on. So then, when you get to hear about other stuff, you're like, oh, I never knew that. That's so right. cool. These conferences are a way to get outside of your research echo chamber bubble. Research niche. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's really cool to start seeing stuff like that, and I kind of hope that continues going into the future. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to think if there was anything else in particular we wanted to cover from that. I mean, not anything... I can't think of anything like in particular in particular. It's not like we wrote notes on like what to talk about. No. Later anything. It was just stuff that stuck with us, because it's now a couple weeks removed now that we have a little bit more time after coming back from the trip and settling back in. Um, yeah, work took up a lot more time than I was anticipating <laughs> for me. But um, you got in, you got your Allosaur bust at yeah. the Maritime Museum in Sydney. Yeah, so the kind of speed speed highlights, I guess. <laughs> so for for kind of reference, Allosaur is my favorite dinosaur of all time, and uh, you've probably seen them in museums and stuff. They're the bronze skulls of dinosaur heads. Um, usually they are you know 16 to 1 or 4 to 1 or you know 15 to 1 uh occasionally you get a 1 to 1 um there was one i saw at a museum last year and i i had a little extra money and i was like ooh they have an allosaur i want it and they go nope that's the display can i have it nope and then when i tried looking it up they were way more than i was at the time able to spend uh as a responsible adult <laughs> and i say that with air quotes um but we were at, weirdly enough, the Sydney Maritime Museum, mm-hmm. which is awesome. If if anyone ever gets to go to Sydney, that is definitely one museum. That was going to be a museum that we like, kind of dropped as mm-hmm. like, oh, like if we have time. Right. And it ended up being one of the ones we had more fun at. Yeah. Because they have a bunch of different uh, Australian ships from World War One, World War Two. They have uh, frigates and freighters and different, yeah, uh, different types of ships that are very cool that are from like the 17th century, the 18th yeah. century, and they're all open to walk through either with a guided tour or just by yourself. And then they have the exhibits inside, which is more based on the history of Sydney and how sailing kind of impacted that, obviously, because it's an island country um they had a traveling or i don't know if it was a permanent or traveling exhibit i think it was a no. it was at least temporary i don't know if right because it, it was part, an, an extra you right. you had to pay for it unless you were like us where we got the the venture pass yeah which covered for three which days also do that yeah um. it, it's three days <laughs> so it could be three days or seven days where basically you get covered for the, at like at least like all main museum zoo attractions mm-hmm. pretty much anything you could think of you'd want to go you're covered um right. playing a flat free up front a lot of big cities have them they're sometimes under different names but um a city pass to like museums and stuff is definitely a yeah. good idea um 
but they had a traveling exhibit uh basically about different marine type dinosaurs yeah i think all r- reptiles reptiles yeah you, thank you for correcting me there will be to- pitchforks and torches. <laughs> um you I never know, know with the comment section i mean my friend jake would probably murder me i know you called a mosasaur a dinosaur Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, I'd be dead. Um, <laughs> but they had all these marine reptiles that, you know, they had the Mosasaur, they had Plesiosaur, Ichthyosaur, they had a, but, and they, yeah. they all weren't specifically just for Australia. They were just in general because it's a maritime museum. Yeah. But it was really cool, and it just, you know. Cause, the gift and, shop. Cause, just, yeah. Because anything paleo-related always has to have dinosaurs in it. Right, it's a requirement. It could be a museum about trilobites <laughs> literally called a trilobite museum and there will be a t-rex action figure somewhere i worked at a mammoth museum mammoths that was our primary thing in the title we had short face bear mammoths what did we have a triceratops and a t-rex toy in the gift shop <laughs> it's i think it's legally required yeah. by paleo people you have to have at least the big two um but it just happened to be in the display case and it was for a really reasonable price and i got it and that was my, I'm very happy I get to leave. <laughs> it was hilarious to get that through an airport. Multiple airports. Multiple yeah. airports. Uh, uh, Houston, Texas, that one was the best because they looked like I was smuggling in a human. Because <laughs> they were like, what is this and why is this in here? I'm like, because it wouldn't fit in my suitcase. And I don't trust you folks in baggage. <laughs> right, I don't trust the people in baggage not to NFL kick my bag all the way down the you know, tarmac. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So that was always fun to see it go through the x-ray and just kind of take a deep breath and go, it's a 16 to 1 bronze allosaur skull. It's not real. You can take it out. Yes, you can touch it. Okay, thank you. Put it back in. Okay, moving on. (laughs) I got to get my own body weight of Tim Tams, which are delicious cookies that, if you want, are on Amazon. Yeah. (laughs) And you can order them. And I have to be watched now with my Amazon account. Um, Are we going to get a junk Amazon order of Tim Tams? No. <laughs> um, but we got to see a bunch of cool, you know, Australia's animals are awesome mm-hmm. too. Traveling through downtown Brisbane at dusk, you get to see their flying foxes, yeah. uh, bats, um, basically flying past. Uh, I love the first night we went for sushi at a restaurant across the, the river. The river. Mm-hmm. And as we're walking, I think it was you that was like, oh my God, look at that bird. That's not a bird. That's a bat. And it was really cool to see them. They had water dragons. Mm-hmm. Um, you, I want to say they're parrots. Um, the the bright green guys. Yeah, they're parrots. Yeah, they they're flying around all over the place, yeah. both in Brisbane and Sydney. Yeah. Um, it's just really cool to see those type of wildlife. Uh, no spiders. No, I could do without that. Right. The land of nope definitely lived up still, it to like its it, name. There's still nope stuff, um, but within the city is not as bad um and in general there's just a more cultural societal awareness of diversity and wildlife down there Mm. um so they're in general a bit more cognizant of human impacts um i think mainly because of the coral reef um and just in general there's a lot more um like i said awareness of diversity and education about that and all that stuff Mm -hmm. but yeah that it was it was a very fun trip i really enjoyed it um Mm -hmm. i enjoyed the vacation aspect (laughs) but i also enjoyed the conference and i got to learn a lot more and i tweeted about it like it was so cool to learn about newer stuff that i either had a very very glancing knowledge of um or just learn about facts and different animals that you know I would not have known. Fangaroo is now my favorite new descriptor <laughs> of of an animal. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I did like the joke, humorous tweet, and it's like, Fangaroo, not a cross between a vampire and a Fangaroo, unfortunately. Like, and the author, the presenter said that, like, unfortunately. So there's quite a few humorous right, everyone, talks. People had a very good humor about themselves for a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it. I would like to see more of those. I guess probably before I ramble on, this would be a good point to do uh, our closing thoughts. Mm-hmm. Um, overall, I like the fact that they're getting more involved with the diversity and representation and not in a way of 
it's forced and there's a big pushback it's definitely an idea of we are doing this or we're having a younger generation call for this because it's not quote unquote the right thing to do it it's it makes the most sense because we really are a more diverse group than it's thought of um and it was just cool internationally to hear from you know countries that i don't hear a lot of research and topic about just because a lot of my stuff is or my interests are in north american you know megafauna Mm -hmm. i don't hear about you know occasionally i out of my own personal preference have heard about australian megafauna but hearing about all the different types and how diverse australia was whereas every time i've ever heard about them it's like yeah, there were three giant wombats, a giant kangaroo, a giant bat, and a giant megalania, which might not be as giant as we originally thought. You know? <laughs> Those were the, like, it was four paleo animals, and then aboriginal people, and then colonization. Right. They're, you know, that's all I heard. But now to, to see it's a very diverse and just very interesting ecological continent Mm -hmm. that really does deserve a lot more research um is really cool to hear and and i would love and i would definitely be one of the first people in line to like read papers and more information about that stuff Mm -hmm. not just dinosaur related but again i i am a mammals person so i really do want to hear more about those mammals yeah um and i guess closing Remarks for me, um, I mean, along the same vein, had an absolute blast being in Sydney um, and doing, like, an adult vacation on my own for the first time um, and going to the zoo and um, the aquarium and all the other museums, um, all that stuff in Sydney. Got to go into the Australian Museum, which is currently closed for renovation. That was the research that Zach mentioned at the beginning and talked to one of the exhibit project leads there about how they, you know, go about making their exhibits and stuff like that, which is stuff that's really interesting to me for research and for career interest long term. Um, And then getting to Brisbane they also have an amazing museum with the Queensland Museum which I took pictures some turned out blurry because wine um but um it was a blast to see and they had the live animals and all of that stuff um and then the obviously the talks um I felt like I had a lot more to go to um in terms of mammal talks and ecology talks this year the past couple years in at SVP, since I've made the transition fully over to mammals, it's been like, well, there's three sessions to go to out of four days. Guess I'll, you know, either sit in a dinosaur talk or walk around or do other stuff. So I felt a lot more, even if not all the talks were exactly in my interests or even if they weren't all, you know, engaging to, to listen to, um, there are just a lot more general sessions about mammals and about ecology um that apply to my interests um and got to meet new people this year um made a lot more new connections within all of that diversity and women in paleo um groups um and I think this was the first time that I went outside of going with Zach of not knowing who was going in terms of my immediate range of friends um from graduate and undergraduate school like I had some people to look up because um a new grad student with the university used to go to school with them in Calgary um but I had never met them before um so it was a new experience for me going to SVP without that like we said earlier that like friend pack emotional support blanket um Welcome to what my world is every time. <laughs> Outside of you, it's like, do I know you? No, please don't but hate me. But I mean, me. we had Holly and Jacob in Calgary oh, and yeah. stuff. Um, but, but no, this is like the, truly the first time that, I mean, I, I, I didn't know people there. Um, but it was the first time that I felt like I, not necessarily had, that's the wrong word, but like didn't have the choice of not 
meeting new people, if that makes sense in a very circular mm. way of saying it. Um, and yeah, I feel like that's a huge takeaway for me wanting to get more involved with the diversity and the women in paleo stuff. It's a really big takeaway for me because I'm getting more involved with that in my normal life as well. Um, trying to be more active on Twitter, um, which is touch and go because I normally am not active on it, but I was during SVP and really liked it. Um, and I mean, I think that's the main takeaways, um, for me, other than the fact that we bought a shit ton of stuff. I mean, what? We didn't buy a lot for ourselves. We did. We actually didn't buy a lot for ourselves. We're just two people that care a lot about friends and family and bought stuff for them. Right. I got all my Christmas shopping. Yeah. So, you know, if family doesn't like it, it's mine. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, it was a great trip overall and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to more SVPs, uh, just because of other things coming up next year. I don't know if I'll be able to do Cincinnati, Mm -hmm. which is the next one. Um, I know you might be able to go. You want to go to just see their museum. Right, because when I was applying for grad schools in 2015, they were just about to start renovations. And for those that don't know, which is probably most people, um, the museums in Cincinnati are in the old Amtrak um, station house. And it looks almost like that old-fashioned clock radio dial like this half circle um thing it's a beautiful 1930s art deco building and it's really cool because there's the history museum the natural natural history museum and the children's museum are all in the same building um so the natural history museum's in one wing um the history museum's in the other and the children's museum is downstairs and it's actually still a functioning rail stop um for amtrak there's like one platform open and so you go through and you walk like all the way past the you know museums, the IMAX, and everything like that. And there's actually still a functioning Amtrak station. Um, but they were doing renovations on the building itself um, because it's a 1930s building. The roof needed renovations and all that stuff, as well as the exhibits. Um, so we're doing the exhibits for I think both the history and the natural history museum. And so they were just about to start that process when I was applying to schools because I did apply there. And so now it would will be six years later with, I'm assuming, a complete museum or else I don't know why they'd be hosting SVP. Um, that's my main reason of wanting to go. Um, hopefully I'll have stuff to present and all of that stuff um, as well. But yeah, that's why I want to go next year. Mm-hmm. Well, and with that, I think that will be a close to our SVP recap podcast talk show um lost some steam there at the end yes i did I, i'm definitely hitting the tail end of my <laughs> brain capacity for today um with that said this is the saurus the saurus podcast i'm zach reed i'm deborah thank you guys for joining us again and i'll see you guys next time